So right now I'm with Phil, who is the founder at, at Ujo Music. I'm a founder of Ujo Music, yeah. There's been about um, five of us focused mainly on this project. Okay, so you're a founder, you're one of the founders at Ujo Music. Mm -hmm. First, can we have an introduction from you? Yes, so I started out in the music industry almost exactly 10 years ago. So in the whole time I've been involved in music, it has been a period of extreme disruption, digital transformation from the iTunes and MySpace all the way through to streaming now. Um, I started out working in record companies and then I had a career as an artist for several years before starting my own independent record company. And basically over that time, I had achieved lots of things that I wanted to do in music um, from a creative perspective and, I, you know, in terms of the kind of concerts that I was playing, the, being on TV, all of these kind of things. But it was amazing how little money it was possible to make doing all of these things. And so I started to refocus on how, what the problems were in the music industry and how they might be, might be fixed. Um, and so I spent a long time thinking about this. I worked with Radiohead and Tom York, with Tom York on a, a, a project called Tomorrow's Modern Boxes, which was the first record commercially released through BitTorrent, and then um, subsequently on release strategies for the new Radiohead album coming out next year. And then after all that, I heard about blockchain, and we've been working on this specific project, Ujo, since um, the spring of this year. So what does, what, is, what does Ujo Music hope to accomplish? Well, it is fundamentally shared infrastructure um, for creative industries built on Ethereum blockchain, by which I mean that it is essentially the pipes, the fundamental pipes through which royalties, licenses, rights can flow. Um, and then the idea is that this core um, infrastructure can be used to support any application or service that wishes to use music. Um, and this solves a number of problems to do with incomplete and conflicting information because we can have a single decentralized database to which everyone contributes and everyone, everyone uses information. Um, we can reduce the number of intermedi intermediaries quite radically between artists and their audience um, by using smart contracts to automate the way that licenses licenses are done. Um, and we can just generally just give more freedom, more access to artists to have control of their careers and keep more of the value that is generated by their work. Okay. Now, in order to understand why what you're doing is valuable, perhaps we need to go into what is the current state uh, by which, you know, royalties or funds flow in the music industry could you give an example assuming assuming that you are the content creator of, of, of a song what 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 is your current experience like and who are the intermediaries between you and the final listener yes yeah, so if you think in terms of a, a song because in music we have songs and recordings and they're totally separate that's one of the many complexities if you think just if you're a songwriter and your song is going to get played on the radio in a country outside of your home country there, say it's Japan, so then a, an organisation in Japan is going to collect the royalties, the local performing rights organisation, and maybe they have a deal with one of the American, um, say you're an American songwriter, one of the American performing rights organisations, and then your publisher will have a deal with one of those, and then you have a deal with the publisher. In each of those cases, they take a different percentage. Um, performing rights societies, it's normally in the region of sort of, it's an average of about 13%. And a publisher is a bit different because it's not purely just taking money and passing it on. It sort of theoretically at least adds value to your career. But you can have at least three intermediaries just in that very simple example, not including the recording and the, the performer and the fact that you have multiple songwriters in different countries and all of these things. But the sort of net outcome is that of the sort of $100 that you, your work generates, between 50 and 60% of it ends up coming to you after two or three years after the event. So it's quite a substantial cost, both in time and, you know, and dollars that, that goes back through this process. Why does it take two or three years? I think a lot of the processes are not particularly efficient and they are, um, you know, they're not automated and some of them aren't even digital, most of them are. Um, 
there's a lot of there's some some of it is down to just a standard reporting period of a you know of a quarter by the time each person has accounted a quarter after the next person you know it starts to turn into years um, there's a lot of complication with reconciling um, uses of music with the people that need to be paid. This is sort of the fundamental thing that all these organisations are doing. Um, and that's where having incomplete data or having conflicting data or having data that's available only in some database that I don't have access to, um, you know, there's a lot of working out that needs to go between knowing that this song has been paid and identifying who is, who's has got to be paid for it. Um, and that's what we hope to be able to automate essentially so in theory you're saying that if if i'm a songwriter mm -hmm. and let's say my song is popular in 15 different countries or yeah. locations then in each country i might have three intermediaries between me and the listener and then there are 15 of these markets so the number of intermediaries in total for my song might be 40 or 45 yeah this is absolutely possible because every country has a an organisation that is responsible for this kind of collection and they have reciprocal arrangements and things, they work together to some extent but just fundamentally you have this system, you have a system of really quite um, distinct markets, you know, some countries have more than one performing rights society and they're, they're just collecting the, the royalties for Belgium or the royalties for Sweden or the royalties for the Netherlands. Um, and so it is extremely complex when you think about the whole world, if you think about 150 countries worth of, um, of these institutions, it's, it's really extreme. And it's especially extreme when you think that I can send emails to people in any country in the world directly. I can send money to people anywhere in the world directly, not even using... Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but even using PayPal or some some existing technology. So these kind of principles of just like an online digital marketplace ought to apply in music rights, but they, they don't really just now. Okay, so now let's type let's talk about how you are gonna reform this system using smart contracts and your first prototype. Yeah. What does it exactly do? So the prototype, um, so it's a single song test case. It's based on a song by Image and Heap. Um, called Tiny Human. And basically it demonstrates how you can start by recording information in this decentralized database, blockchain database, which um, says who owns what, under what terms music can be used, and who needs to be paid when the music is used. And so first of all, you have a, just a permanent, um, definitive and single you know, database of this information. That is written into the smart contract such that when you use the music, when a payment, payment comes in, the right people get paid. You know? So um, there's a policy attached to a stream. Um, when music gets streamed, you know, we know what needs to happen when a stream takes place. The right to, get to, to broadcast a stream goes one way and the money goes to the, the relevant people in the, in the other direction. Um, and because it's on the blockchain, it's transparent, so you can see on our prototype, you can go and see that Imogen had a, a policy for downloads in which she has X percent of the income because she wrote the song and is the record company and everything else. And then you as a participant in that, in that work can, can follow the thread all the way through so that you can look at the what we call in our prototype distributions and see that you were paid what you should have been paid. So it's transparent, you can trust it. And by having this, you know, this is the whole, whole point, decentralized trust system in the blockchain, you don't need intermediaries to do it for you. Oh, so, so in this case, imagine as the, as the content creator uploads a file at, at, at a, maybe a central location, then goes to Ethereum, creates a smart contract, uh, feeds in the information about who should be paid what, and uh, what uh, what kind of rights uh, a user can buy yeah. puts that in the smart contract now a user when he wants to either listen to the recording or wants to broadcast that recording can check out what the different prices for all of these schemes yeah select one of them transfer yeah. money to the smart contract and get the file yeah and then the smart contract takes that money figures out who should be paid how much yeah. and automatically routes their uh, this to their ethereum accounts right yeah that's exactly it. Um, and well, that's exactly it. I can't really expand on it. It's very well described. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, that seems, to be honest, that seems like a really, really great system because, you know, um, you, it's, it's a global system and it's completely, completely trans transparent. But um, <clears throat> kind of 
I have I have two 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 fundamental questions about it. Mm-hmm. The first is um, this is not supposed to combat the problem of piracy, right? It is supposed to be a system which people who are actually willing to pay the artists can use to pay the artists. Well, it doesn't combat piracy in the sense that it's not a kind of strict DRM system. It's not really envisaged as that. But if you create a permanent link between the content and the terms of use associated with the content and the people that need to be paid from the content through by using a hash of the content, you know, stored on the blockchain, then um, it makes it much easier to know whenever your content is used what the terms are that go with that content. The two things are linked together. Um, and beyond that, if we imagine a sort of totally automated future, then it ought to be possible for audio recognition, fingerprint software to pick up that a song is used and trigger something in the smart contract that makes something happen. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that this platform is not just sort of facing individuals, or maybe it's rarely facing individuals, but it's sort of things like big blanket licenses for radio broadcast around the world or for all streaming and all, all these kinds of things. Um, so it's not necessarily addressing the question of piracy on a sort of the scale of an individual. It's not really its focus. And um, since Ethereum is a very niche token that very mm. few people use, uh, yeah. How will you bring how will you bring this technology to all these people in the world that are using dollars that are still in the world of dollars and pounds and whatnot? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think people gen- generally um, you see around this conference have differing views on it. Some people just believe that cryptocurrency is the future and we should commit fully to it and expect everybody to adopt it. Um, My view is that if technology like this is going to be adopted widely, then it's got to be easy for people to use it. And we should not put any barrier in the way way of people using it. And so we're going to have to find ways of, you know, invisible conversion of these these tokens um, such that the ether is used in the oil in the machine, but but the artists don't necessarily need to hold ether for any substantial amount of time. but these are sort of questions that I guess we as a community are having to, to answer, and there are lots of different <laughs> um, ideas being put forward. More generally about adoption, I think people adopt it if it is easy to use and if they get value from using it. Um, and so that applies not just in the case of the, the, the currency aspect, but just in terms of the whole system. I mean, the whole system has to add value to people's careers. They have to make more money from it or find more customers through it or whatever it is. And if that is proven to be the case for the first users of this platform, then more users will join it. And there's obviously a switching cost with any new technology, but basically the benefits have to outweigh the switching cost. That's the the fundamental challenge. Now, the advantage to the artist in this case is pretty clear, uh, that they get a a higher share of the the revenues of of the content content they create. Uh, what, what, What is the advantage to the listener? When they, as compared to any other service like a streaming service like Spotify or Apple Music or whatever. Well, I think that we are probably not going to presume to be experts at the experience side of it. It to be left up to other people who develop their own applications and services based on the, the core functionality of Ujo. So a future Spotify or, or Spotify can plug into one end and, and use that for the, for the consumer. And the consumer should still have a broad choice of um, experiences and yeah that's important um, what will they get out of it either they get nothing out of it because they're, they're, they are unconcerned with these questions but the artist does better um, or the prices might be cheaper because basically we're creating value um, by reducing the cost and then that can be distributed to people at either end of the chain so you can say if it currently costs a dollar to buy this song maybe, and, and of that, an artist gets, a say, 25 cents. Well, there's no reason why you can't set the price such the artist gets more than 25 cents, but the, the customer pays less than a dollar, you know, so the value can be shared around the system between the creators and their customers. Uh, disintermediation, yeah, could make it cheaper for the consumer as well. That's a, that's, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting point. So what has been the f- feedback to, what kinds of feedback have you received regarding your first release of Imogen Heap song? So it's been really extraordinary. Um, 
This is a project that's only really existed since the spring of this year, and more broadly in the music industry, it has only been spoken about, this has been spoken about for about a year, but generally in very hypothetical, theoretical way. But in the last, I would say, three or four months, there have been a number of events that have resulted in uh, a big uptake in interest, one of which was um, a report by Berkeley College of Music, which was very widely reported, which had recommendations for, bit, for blockchain. Um, and this means that it is at least a topic of discussion amongst all of the big music companies, all of the big performing rights societies, a lot of artists. And specifically in our case, having um, produce this prototype. We have had discussions with some pretty big artists about the poss possibilities for them. We've had um, been approached by a number of big rights holders, so record companies and publishers, to explore it for them, managers of big artists, and um, also some institutions, um, performing rights societies, that are owned and controlled by songwriters and publishers. So their natural incentives to do, to do anything that supports songwriters and publishers. So they are all interested in it. Um, it's very difficult to know what the exact precise path forward will be, but what I can say is it's just an extraordinary amount of interest, you know, interest and awareness now and excitement and or fear in some cases of what blockchain can bring about. And I think we're going to see, certainly in our case, various experiments prototypes, collaborations, um, while we find out you know, what the definitive model is for this technology in, in music. So do you have some concrete steps after your first prototype, improvements that you know you are going to make? Um, yeah, in terms of functionality, I mean, obviously this was a single artist prototype. It didn't really have any artist-facing capability to upload things. Um, we would like to add Bitcoin payments in the future, all these kinds of things. We'd like to do more work on where the content is stored because that's sort of separate to the blockchain layer just now. Um, all of those things, but in terms of specific next steps, we have spe specific projects that we're working towards, which will be sort of more advanced releases of this um, based on the content of a particular artist or a particular rights holder. And we expect to do two or three or four of those in the first six months of next year. So you, you might be, if, if this goes well, you might be creating tremendous value, not only for artists, but uh, listeners of music around the world and you deserve to have a platform that you can monetize for the for the service you did mm. um, but what what strategy do you have to monetize a platform in which the logic is an open is on an open system like ethereum well that is a very very good question a very difficult question to answer i mean i think that fundamentally for this platform to create the value as you say it's going to have to be open it's going to have to be decentralized that's the whole point there's no point in us creating the system and owning it and then charging rent on it and then like, it just does not the same it's not the same idea um so basically we just believe that by creating this, as you say, a certain amount of value is going to be created and we are going to have to build additional application service around the edge, around the edge in order to monetize it, you know, in order for our own self-greedy interest. Um, and that may be that we are helping big organizations migrate their, you know, their services onto, onto this kind of platform. It may be that we build customer-facing things that are separate to the core infrastructure. It could be a whole range of different things. Um, which we're working on, which I can't tell you in great detail, but which we're working on just now. All right. Do you have anything else to add? No, great talking to you. I hope you're having a good conference. Yeah. And yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Thanks.